This, this is, is TLV1. The Tel Aviv Review with Gilad Halpern. Hello and welcome to the Tel Aviv Review, a program dedicated to the word, to the thought and to debate, brought to you by the Van Lee Jerusalem Institute, which promotes humanistic, democratic and liberal values in the social discourse in Israel. I'm your host, Gilad Halpern, and every week I'll be engaging in close encounters of the intellectual kind with writers and scholars, or simply people of ideas of all types and vocations who have done something to make our lives a tad more interesting. My guest today is a lecturer of history of modern and contemporary art and architecture at Shankar College of Engineering, Art and Design in Ramat Gan, not far from here. He is also the co-editor of a new collection of essays that's dedicated to Richard Kaufmann, a Jewish-German architect who was hired in the early 1920s as the chief architect of the Zionist leadership here in Palestine and was responsible for some of the pioneering structures that we see around us to this day in this country, such as the Prime Minister's house in Jerusalem and the outline of Nahalal, the first Moshav in the Jezreel Valley, as well as many, 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 many others. The trail of Israeli independence is dotted with Kaufman's works. And on Monday, the 26th of September, the Van Leer Jerusalem Institute is organizing a tour of Jerusalem, following in Kaufman's footsteps in the honor of of the publication of the book. And it will be led by Professor Michael Levine, who's now joining me here in the studio. Hello, Michael. Hello. And welcome to the Tel Aviv Review. Um, so let's talk about Kaufman the Man. Was he just in the right place at the right time? Or was he really an exceptionally talented architect? I think both. I think he was the right man in the right time because at that time there were very few architects active in Israel and there were hardly any town planners And although uh, most of the things he designed are not necessarily towns, but uh, garden suburbs and Moshavim and Kibbutzim and, and other uh, rural uh, settlements, uh, the arrival of uh, Erhard Kaufmann in 1920 was a result of invitation of uh, Dr. Arthur Rupin, who was the, secretary, the, the Israeli secretary of the Jewish agency. And I even don't know how he found him. He was at that time in Helsinki. designing the University of Helsinki and, design, and, and after some experience in designing uh, garden suburbs in Germany, in Russia, and in Norway. And uh, since he was a Zionist, he was uh, thrilled and very enthusiastic to come to Palestine in 1920. And uh, you won't believe it, how much he designed in the first decade of his uh, career in, in Israel. Mm. In the first 10 years, 1920, 1930, he managed to plan not all, uh, the six garden suburbs of Jerusalem, Rehavia, Bet HaKerem, Bait Vagan, uh, Kiryat Moshe, and Talpiot. But also in Haifa, he, designed in, he was not asked to design the whole, the entire plan of Haifa, but he did first Bad Galim, which is near the seashore, and then Hadar, which is in between the Carmel and the lower city. And then he was asked to do the Carmel, and it was divided into sections, Central Carmel, French Carmel, etc., etc., and then further on, even Ahuza and uh, Neve Shana. So, so you would say that there wasn't an architect in Israeli history that left such a big mark no. on the landscape and, of In this, time, in this time, no. No, in, 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 yeah. in general. Yeah, I think until the, uh, the establishment of the state, he had more than 600 projects in a very small office. Uh, nowadays, architects who are designing so many projects have um, hundreds of workers. He had four or five people working uh, for him. Uh, so uh, it's even more impressive to think that at the same time that he was designing Nahalal, and I have to explain why Nahalal is so important. This was the first cooperative settlement, Moshav, And he dramatically designed it in such a way that everybody can see the equality, that everybody has the same field, the same chunk, same land. And um, uh, the aerial photographs of Nahalal were illustrating a lot of Zionist publications for years to come. Because uh, in a one photograph, you can see the dramatic... Uh, the, the aerial yeah, photograph. Yeah, the aerial photograph. You can see how the center was dedicated to the people's house, to the schools, to all the things that were communally owned, like tractors and heavy tools and so on. But each one had his own parcel of land. And uh, so... Um, This was the first 
a cooperative settlement, but he later on designed, already in the 20s, all the settlements in the Emek Israel and also in uh, Emek Hefer. And it includes kibbutzim, very important kibbutzim, like Tel Yosef and Harod. And so... Uh, really it, the cradle of, yes. uh, of Zionism. Right. I, I want to ask you, you said that he was a, an enthusiastic Zionist when he came mm-hmm. here. Did it transpire into his work? Would you say that his designs were ideological Zionist in definitely, any way? Definitely, definitely. That's the interesting thing. This was a period when people believed that architecture and town planning can influence the quality of life and the, the, the ideology. So it was the ideology that was leading the planning. In, in other words, the idea was that if you design a good settlement with good architecture, you'll have good people. We now think about it as a little bit naive, but uh, uh, definitely the way he looked at it was first going back to the land, working in agriculture. He designed also in the first uh, kibbutz, Kibbutz Ganya, the school and the children's home. And he also tried to fit it to the climate because the climate there is it's very near the um, African-Syrian valley, uh, which could be 40 degrees uh, centigrade or more and 100% humidity. So he designed a double roof so that the sun will hit the top roof and the wind will get rid of the heat. And so the children... Did, did he develop those tricks uh, himself? Yes. Or was it yes. uh, something that he brought uh, with him from no, Europe? No, no, not at all. The idea of the Garden City brought from Europe. The idea was the Garden City, the idea was to do something against the um, Industrial Revolution. Because the Industrial Revolution uh, brought uh, the fume and uh, the um, lower quality of life because in many times the factory and the residential area were one next to the other. And so the idea of the Garden City was to have a limited size of cities with a lot of greenery and a communal green in the center. And uh, so... um, That fit very much the ideas of the Zionist movement at that time. So um, definitely it had the political and and, uh, utopian ideas were reflected in it. And in in a way, that's why Nahalal as a circle, more than an ellipse, uh, fitted dramatically how to show how the equality, because uh, you don't have to explain. One photograph shows you everything about it. In most of the uh, places, in most of the residential areas, it had to do with garden axis, so that uh, children could go to school without uh, the interference of cars. And we have to remember in 1920, there were not a lot of cars. So it's uh, nice to think that... uh, And I myself lived in Rehavia, where I'm conducting this tour, and I used to go through this garden axis, and every time that I was there, I heard the bells of the school, and I knew that I'm going to be late again. Mm -hmm. But uh, when you look at the neighborhood, it was not only the garden axis, but uh, each lot uh, had... It was planting trees in the sidewalks but also in each lot people were planting trees so as a result when you walk now it's very difficult to photograph the buildings because they are all covered with trees mm-hmm. uh, w- would you say that uh, the landscape that he designed did he adapt it well into the environment that he, he was in was it did it turn into something i would say indigenous or would you say that still at the end of the day it's still an imposition from the outside no, it was not an imposition because I think, first of all, when he was designing Kibbutzim and Moshavim, he was careful that where the cows are, uh, the wind will not bring the smell to the residential area. So he, every place he was really checking before the, all, all the conditions and uh, because the topography is different. If there is a mountain or mound or, or hill, he would use it. Usually on the hill he would put the people's home or the dining hall of the kibbutz, which will be the central place. And uh, I think dramatically you can see it in Haifa because he designed all these neighborhoods in Haifa, most of Haifa and he left um, all the valleys open so that uh, the breeze from the sea will come that uh, a lot of people will be able to see from their homes the Mediterranean seashore mm. and although as you know in Israel uh, what is public many times people tend to annex later on to a private section sure. uh, still you can see that this was kept and, uh, and the quality of life uh, remained and another example that you can see is in a neighborhood in Jerusalem, Beta uh, This neighborhood was for workers and writers. Uh, the common denomination is that they are poor. And so the houses were um, small, and also they were not forced to clad it with stone, as the regulation in Jerusalem was, because it was considered far away. <laughs> what was far away now is part oh, of the city. Right, yeah. But uh, what happened is that I think there are very, very few 
maybe only three, four buildings left from the 20s. And all of the buildings that were first served one family now are serving 16 families. And still it is a very much in demand. The, the quality of life in the neighborhood because of the trees, because of the curves of the streets, so that from the beginning you don't see the end. And there is a mm-hmm. sense of privacy and landscaping that uh, made the, the neighborhood still uh, um, a very desired uh, place. So he was really pioneering in many, many ways, uh, qualitatively as well as quantitatively. As you said, in the first decade in Palestine, he designed hundreds of projects. What was his, the nature of his work later on in the late years of the mandate and into the state years? Well, before the, uh, the end of the mandate, there were still a couple of decades and they were very important because in the end of the first decade of his uh, work in Palestine, he started to design buildings. He was asked by Novomesky to design the residential building and the home of the director of the Potash workers in the Dead Sea. If I was telling you about Ghana, how hot it was, then in the Dead Sea, it's even hotter. And so what he designed, uh, and it shows also the developer was, I mean, the man who built this factory was also aware of the quality of life of the workers. So each one of these workers have a double roof. And there were also small holes that the idea was that uh, the wind will take the heat from the room itself, not only from the roof. Unfortunately, it works only if the wind is going in both directions exactly. How uh, often does that happen? Uh, not enough, no, mm-hmm. not enough, not enough. But uh, the fact is that he spent a lot of energy. Also, the roof is almost protruding outside. And uh, this he did also in the houses he designed in Rehavia and in Tel Aviv. And the importance of this uh, rooflet or protruding element is that it protects you uh, from the sun in the summer. If you come at 12 noon, you can see that it covers exactly the side of the mm. window. So you really calculate the size of the roof so it, it will cover it. But in the winter, since the sun changes its zenith, you can get the rays because you want the rays of the sun because this is a great pleasure in the winter. And in addition, it protects you from the rain. So it did a lot of devices to make the life easier. And that's all pre-air conditioning. Because sure. unfortunately, nowadays, architects are very lazy. They can design whatever they want and make a lot of uh, uh, mistakes or ignore completely weather condition. And you pay more bills for electricity, but uh, you can get the climate w- w- you want. W- would you say that uh, generations of Israeli architects uh, were influenced by him? Was he really the main influence of what Israeli architecture later became? He was uh, definitely a very vital force. But we have to remember that uh, in the 30s, was a lot of immigration of uh, architects from Europe and also some Israelis who went to study in Europe. So there were Three leading architects who studied at the Bauhaus and five who worked in the Le Corbusier office. But every famous architect and famous academy in Europe had at least one Israeli. And there were 18 graduates of the Bauhaus who arrived to Palestine. So as a result, in the 30s, there were a lot of important architects. Mm-hmm. And uh, so he was one of them. And when you think about the group of the Jerusalemite architects, he and Erich Mendelssohn was his classmate who immigrated to Palestine only in 34. But also Heinz Rau and uh, Leopold Krakow, they were the leading architects of the Jerusalem gang. I'm calling them gang because Tel Aviv had its own group. Sure. And the, the, those from Jerusalem were lucky to do some buildings in Tel Aviv and in Haifa. Those from Tel Aviv hardly had a chance to do something be, outside be, Tel Aviv. Because Kaufman uh, submitted a plan for Tel Aviv that was rejected. Yes, yes. Uh, actually, it was not rejected because the plan was not good. Uh, maybe in our book, uh, Richard Kaufman in a pro- uh, Zionist project, we try to show that maybe his project was even better. But uh, the people in Tel Aviv felt that if they will ask a British designer, like Sir Patrick Geddes, then the British authorities will be more um, open to the ideas and allow the people in Tel Aviv to do what they want. So they were looking really for the fame of Geddes, and Geddes was friendly with Kaufman, and he was uh, kind enough to invite him to join the Garden Cities Association in, in Britain, and invited him also to talk and to tell about his work in Palestine. But uh, Geddes himself was not a planner. Uh, he was a biologist. He was an interesting character. Uh, the British were always very kind to allow experiments outside Britain. Uh, so uh, he did something in India. He did something in Cairo. And uh, there were 
ready to have his experiments in the, the Holy Land and not necessarily in, in how, Great Britain. How would Kaufman's plan be better than Geddes's? It's only a question uh, of uh, how to deal with the seashore and how to relate to the seashore because uh, we know that the seashore has a breeze and it actually got, also Geddes was aware of it and so he was planning what were called the Geddes uh, blocks so that uh, a narrow part of it will turn to the south which with, in Tel Aviv gets a lot of heat and the bigger part will face the sea breeze. Uh, Kaufman had an idea to start the city straight from the seashore. Uh, we know that uh, Tel Aviv discovered the seashore only about um, eight years later, uh, which is a pity. You know? how, how, how do you mean? I mean, it was always, uh, it always was, there. It was the idea of uh, Mayor Rabinovich and it was followed by uh, Shlomo Lat. which we call Cheech. What happened is that the seashore was mainly was a place of uh, crime and illegal uh, lotteries and things like that. And um, in a way, similar to Barcelona, was more or less in the same time, decided to get rid of all the factories near the seashore and uh, give the people a direct access. And recently, we have even more dramatic uh, step because now they, when you walk on the sidewalk, there is no border. Yet there are steps that you can sit there and you watch the sea. So the sea becomes really part of the city. Uh, so, so, so before that, there was a very clear separation. Yes. Mm. Uh, so uh, I, I would say that uh, I, I have to remind you that uh, he designed also Ramat Gan and Herzliya. So it's not only uh, neighborhoods, but also towns. He also designed the Fula, but uh, nothing happened with, according to his plans. At that time, it was an, an American company who was selling people a uh, lot next to the opera. It was supposed to be an opera in Afula. It was hardly opera in Tel Aviv, uh, but the places that were closer to the opera, of course, were more expensive. So this company went bankrupt, and by the time they really moved to Afula, the plans of uh, Kaufman oh, <laughs> were forgotten. Yeah. Let's talk about the tour uh, that you're going to lead in, in Jerusalem. What is the purpose of it? What are you really going to... see and show the well, people. Well, luckily, Rehavia, uh, um, which is one of the other five neighborhoods uh, designed in Jerusalem, a lot of buildings that uh, were designed by Kaufman, but also by the other architects that I mentioned, Karako, Erao, and the uh, nearby buildings by Mendelssohn, because Mendelssohn designed the library and the home of uh, uh, Schocken, who was, Zalman Schocken was a publisher, famous publisher, owner of department stores in Germany, and he knew uh, Mendelssohn already in Germany, so when he came to Palestine, he commissioned him, like Professor Weizmann in Rehovot, and the interesting thing about it is the Prime Minister House, which was at the edge of Rehavia, designed by Kaufman, was designed for a rich Egyptian Jew by the name of Agion, and that was between the library and the house of uh, Schocken. And in this case, Kaufman did the gesture of goodwill, and this is the building that uh, Kaufman designed, which serves now the prime minister, is more Mendelssohnian than the Mendelssohn buildings, hmm. uh, in the way because it has this round curve and uh, two um, wings. Uh, but uh, I think uh, what we'll see in Rehave, we'll be able to see the Garden City access. We'll be able to see the small streets and the streets that are de- with the trees and the way it was designed so that um, the most important element in the neighborhood will be the school. Not a commercial thing, but a school. That's the Gymnasia Ivrit, mm. which I happened to study there for 12 years. Huh. Uh, I don't have so, a lot of sentimental memories so, so it's basically, memories yeah, and, and, yeah, so it's a nostalgic tour for you uh, For more than that, because uh, when I was 11, my family moved to the house designed by Kaufman. It was the Osishkin house. Osishkin was the leader, one of the Zionist leaders. And uh, when he died, the, the, his, the son and daughter were living on the ground floor, and we were given the apartment uh, of uh, Osishkin. And I was sleeping in the bedroom of Osishkin, which was not a good room. It was called Cyber. Iberia by the owners because <laughs> it was the coolest. It was facing north because in Jerusalem, the best direction is south because the, you enjoy the sun in the winter at least. In the winter. But uh, it was a beautiful house. I must say, not very convenient for a family with two young children. It right. was an apartment built for a man who wanted to impress people. Uh, the jokes were that the street was called after him during his lifetime. So he wanted to go through the street and then the second street would be 
קרן קיימת, which originally was supposed to be שמואל הנגיד, and אוסישקין סביר was supposed to be יהודה הלוי. And these are the only two Ashkenazi, uh, because all the neighborhood is called after the Middle Ages uh, philosopher, poets of Spain. Mm-hmm. And um, so these are the two exceptions. So only אוסישקין uh, uh, matched their greatness. Yes, something like that. And <laughs> yeah. uh, there were a lot of jokes telling that, saying that um, Suskin used to clean the street sign uh, with his name, but it's not a true story yeah. because uh, it's too high. <laughs> it's too hard to, to get right. there. Um, one last question because we will have to wrap up soon. This is uh, really the uh, collection of essays that was just published. It's the first one that's dedicated to Kaufmann that died, who died almost 60 years ago. Why was he forgotten in the literature like that? Um, well, I must say that uh, there are not a lot of uh, monographs anyhow. There are very few monographs. And uh, one of the problems was that uh, the archive was deposited at the Central Zionist Archive. Uh, but uh, the family had some reservation of uh, using, using it. So I published two articles in 1980. And then later on, uh, I was told by the archive that I can go. research it but I cannot use any of the illustrations in mm. the, so I stopped the research I didn't see uh, any oh, so it wasn't it. forgotten it was just a technical right, issue right all right uh, uh, I must say one yeah. one last thing is yes. that originally th- there's only one street called after him and the, the street is not called Kaufman it's called the architect and in brackets it says Kaufman mm-hmm. and uh, in Jerusalem in Jerusalem not in a neighborhood that he designed and But uh, there's a painter by the name of Eli Shamir who lives in Kfar Yoshua. He lived in Jerusalem for about two decades, but he returned to Kfar Yoshua, which was planned by Kaufman. And uh, he convinced the people of the settlement to design a gazebo, a small kiosk, which underneath there is a mosaic like the Madba map. An ancient map of, of uh, the Holy Land and it shows the different sites that he planned including his face and uh, there's something very touching about it because it was not done by the state and not by the family and not by the Zionist organizations or anything it was an initiative of a settler in this place who felt yeah. that uh, he deserved this kind of so, honor. So did he remain a committed Zionist and uh, yes, a, a devoted to the cause until the very right. end? The last project that he was involved was the Hebrew University, the Givat Ram campus, which I was teaching there for about 80 years. And I must say, it's a wonderful campus. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was very sorry to move to Mount Scopus. Okay. Well, uh, this is all thanks to uh, Richard Kaufmann, the legendary and pioneering uh, Jewish-German Zionist architect that uh, really um, is almost single-handedly responsible for the Israeli landscape as we know it. Professor Michael Levine, uh, co-editor of a new collection of essays dedicated to him and the leader of a tour that will be organized by the Van Leer Jerusalem Institute next week on the 26th of uh, September. Thank you very much Thank for you. joining us today. Pleasure. And also a uh, big thanks to Itai Shalem for his production help. and for the Van Leer Institute for the generous support. If you like this podcast, there are many more where it came from. Just go to www.tlv1.fm slash podcast and take your pick. Also check out our new website, www.telavivreview.org and like our new page on Facebook, the Tel Aviv Review, Ideas from Israel. And please get in touch with your comments and suggestions. We'd love to hear from you. Join us again for another edition of the Tel Aviv Review. And until then, goodbye. כל רגע בו אנו חיים הוא רגע חדש כל רגע בו אנו חיים אין שני לא ביקום לא היה כמותו מעולם